<laughs> and welcome back to another edition of the Rancor Pit. We had our uh, our big D and D game, the Heroes and Villains campaign, um, yesterday. That would be Sunday, because today is Monday, and um, a lot of craziness ensued. <laughs> I actually had a, a player die due to a triple twenty rolled by a mimic in the shape of a uh, a grand and inviting bed, oddly enough. So, <clears throat> this episode, I want to cover, cover a few different things, one of which is what I promised you guys, which is the tale of my dice. Now, I didn't always have this roller. My wife got me this at the uh, Pirate Day Festival uh, down out in Fort Myers near Clearwater Beach, where her parents have a a uh, retirement trailer, basically. So I didn't always have this, but after I got it, I used it. Uh, we'll get to the dice in a second, though. <clears throat> I did promise you guys some um, inside information about some of the stuff, other stuff that I created for Star Wars RCR. Everybody remembers what RCR is? Revised Core Rules? Okay. Um, you guys already saw my, my Star Wars Game Master Guide, my folder that I compiled. And I already showed you guys the um, charts that I did for the uh, stuff, the junk, the swag. Um, well, what I'm going to talk about this time is some of the stuff that I had created, um, both with an insane amount of my personal time, effort, and imagination, as well as all of my other players around me. Uh, chief among them are some of my, uh, my former roommates, and, well, I should say former roommate, I don't want to give a wrong impression, uh, my former roommate and um, my friend here who actually lives in the same complex we do, and we've compiled a number of things over the years, and whenever I came up with something new, I bounced it off of them, tried to get a feel to see if it was even feasible or, or workable, and um, I come up with a number of prestige classes, actually. Um, creating a prestige class in D&D is a lot harder, I find. And I tried. I, I, I legitimately gave it a shot, and I tried. It's actually a lot easier to create factions in D&D uh, 3.5 than it is creating prestige classes for some reason. I guess because there is so many prestige classes, it'd be like, well, I'm trying to do this, 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 and this. Well, this is the closest thing you're going to get to it. You're not really losing anything, and you kind of go, huh, okay. Uh, in Star Wars, it's not the classes that are the, the star of the show. Uh, whenever it comes to playing it. It's actually the races, or the species. Um, the Ultimate Alien Anthology, one of the, my oldest books actually up on the shelf, has a 180 playable races. You don't get that in D&D. It doesn't happen. It doesn't come anywhere close. Um, the Coruscant to the Core Rules uh, book, that has some. The Genesis and the Outer Rims book, that has some. It's well over 180. It's probably closer to 200. And there's a couple of the other ones that I've uh, come across. There used to be a great resource uh, from the Wizards of the Coast site. It was literally Star Wars uh, Wizards of the Coast, and it had this like huge like forum. I used to go to the Praxeum all the time and go get like information and ideas and custom jobs and and uh, people that had taken all Saga stuff and converted it to RCR for us, RCR guys. And uh, I posted a whole bunch of stuff there. And thankfully Wizards, or I should say Hasbro now, hmm, Hasbro did archive the site so that I still can get access to what I posted. Because there is some of the stuff that I posted that I didn't hard copy. Um, mostly due to laziness. But some of it's because I just didn't have access to time or, in this case, printer with ink. It's ex expenditure. Um, so, uh, I created a, one of my, uh, the first one I created was called a, uh, Blast Fighter. Modeled exactly off of what you would think out of the, uh, Wild West, uh, American Wild West gunfighter, uh, ideal. Um, very much flashy, uh, very, very good at the lowest level against crowds for disarming. Uh, its ultimate ability whenever you, and it's only a fifth level prestige class, it's pretty, it's a short one. Um. The fifth ability is called Revocation, and you're going to notice a theme whenever I built prestige classes. I pulled elements from either books, expanded universe information, 
or a lot of it came from movies and other ideas. Uh, this was one of them. Blast Fighter uh, for the fifth fifth uh, level ability was called Revocation. I modeled it after the the last one of the last very last scenes in Lethal Weapon Two. Okay, so think back. Um, whenever, whenever the bad guy was, uh, and I, his name escapes me, sue me, uh, was way up on the, um, the frigate, way up on, uh, where the bow was, not the bow, but the, the deck was, and Murtaugh was down below on the main deck, and poor Riggs was down in the forecastle, the forecastle, and, and, uh, he held up his credentials and said, diplomatic immunity, and... Murtaugh took one shot, and he aimed it, and went right through his brain, and he says, it's just been revoked. Well, I used that ideal and that scenario to actually create the revocation ability. What it does is, Blast Fighter, you always have to win initiative. It's a fast prestige class. You have to win initiative, and it's only for uh, blaster pistols and slug thrower pistols. That's it. Can't be used for, for anything else. No rifles, no, no, no none of it. Um, you got to win initiative. And then you have to hold your action, declare to go last. So you're letting everybody else go in the, in the initiative stack, including the bad guys. And you're flat-footed, which sucks. Uh, but if you're alive by the time your turn comes around at the end of the round... Um, I forget exactly what the mechanic was because, I, I, like I said, I don't have it hard copied. That's come, it's on the uh, Wizard of the Coast side. But I'm pretty sure that you got to apply um, you got to apply your damage to, to wound points because in Star Wars um, you don't have hit points. You have vitality points which are the energy you expend to dodge near misses <clears throat> and to narrowly escape death which would be jumping behind corners or jumping into the blast radius or diving behind for something for a firefight. That's all vitality. And then you have wound points, which is actual physical trauma when you actually take something, right? Uh, I think a number of it went to wound points. Whenever you take wound points in Star Wars, it's serious business because you could just simply be fatigued or you could be knocked out, which would then, you know, ruin your day, uh, amongst other things. But yeah, imagine that holding your action, going last, and then one shot. Bam. Dead. Um, that was only one of them. Another one I created was something called a blue collar stiff. I um, I didn't really model this after anything I saw in in uh, expanding universe or literature. It was more like a bunch of movies that I had just eventually seen. It's all about normal people in this case, like miners, uh, grease monkeys, repair jockeys, nurses, tinkerers, general laborers. Um, they'd all have to work with their hands and with tools all the time, right? Uh, they'd be able to use those tools to an actual lethal advantage. And I created, in one of my other um, spirals, I created a whole list of basic stuff that would be in a toolkit, basic stuff that would be in a repair kit, basic stuff that would be in a surgery kit, and uh, basic stuff that would be in a technician's kit, I think it was. And I listed what kind of damage that a blue-collar stiff, uh, a BCS, would actually be able to do with these mundane items. And a lot of them have really weak damages compared to... Because a, pla a blaster pistol in Star Wars... you got to understand this. A blaster pistol... Uh, let's say what, what Han uses. Just DL, DL-44, Blastac DL-44. Um does 3d8 worth of damage. Now, in, unless you're using, like, oversized weaponry in D&D, &D, you're never going to see 3d8 worth of damage on a single weapon. But that's because vitality and hit points don't work the same. Right. Um, uh, DL-44, 3d8. Um, E-11, Blastec E-11 blaster that the stormtroopers used, 3d8. See the power mix? Normal blaster pistols are only 3d6. But again, you know, you, you think of that, 3d6? What does 3d6 in D&D? &D? Oversized weaponry, right? Um, so, I mean, a lot of the stuff is like, um, spanners, uh, hydro spanners, pliers, wrenches, mauls, um, uh, clamps, all kinds of stuff that like are normal do low damage, but they have all these extra really nifty abilities. Like, you know, one of the things is, okay, it's a pair of pliers, simple lobster claw pair of pliers. Basically, I think it did a D3 bashing 
and you can actually hold it as a grapple. As long as you held it, they were grappled, right? A little low damage, but I mean, it starts to grapple. Um, and then there was power clamps where you, it's still a D3, but you can literally clamp it on and then release it, and it would still continuously do damage every round. You're not grappling, but it's, it's an every round damage, and they actually have to reach up and unclamp it. Um, and then there was um, <clears throat> pneumatic clamps, I think I made, where you, it's, it's a lot bigger. It's like almost like a modified size of a Jaws of Life. You basically would clamp it on a, on a limb, um, that limb's useless. So if it's your firing arm, which things are normally right-handed, if it's your firing arm, you drop what you're holding and you can't use it until you find a way to pry it off. See? Um, Hydra spanners. Basically, the Star Wars equivalent of throwing daggers, which would normally be used for, you know, mechanics, but perfect perfect balanced throwing dagger. Um, I, had all, I had a whole list of this crap for the BCS. Um, they... Um, have the ability to actually lessen the intense uh, defense bonus that a target gets whenever you go to use a called shot. Called shot's a little more used in Star Wars than it is D&D that I find. If you go to use a called shot, and in uh, Star Wars, they get a range between, I think it's like 3 to like 13 to their defense. It's a huge span, and thir plus 13 is a huge number. So imagine being able to use improvised weaponry with secondary effects, and be able to target something a lot easier. So, um, so yeah, that's the blue collar stuff. I made an ataxic effigy. This one's a little more complicated, but I'll try to condense it. Um, one of the examples of a Jedi Master in... I want to say it's the Power, Power of the Jedi source book. I have it. Um, I want to say it's in there. It kind of looked like this non-horned Triceratops creature that it basically had transcended its beast abilities and had actually grown an intelligence, a real intelligence. That's because I think it took, if I remember right, the highly evolved template. And templates aren't as big a thing as they are in D&D. Uh, there's only like half a dozen, or maybe eight or nine templates in Star Wars. Uh, it took the highly evolved template and it began to spawn real sentience and it ended up being a Jedi Master. And of course it would look a little silly because this thing is quadrupedal with a tail with like, you know, this big white goatee at the end of it. It looked a little silly for it to use like lightsabers, but it obviously would have access to the force and whatnot. Um, well, I took it a step further. I took it so that you could take almost any creature out of the Ultimate Adversaries book, which is essentially the monster manual. Like half of it is really good NPCs. Right in the middle is like companies. So if you need a mercenary scout or you need like a, a somebody in a crime syndicate or something like that, right in the middle of the book is all that. But the other the other half of it essentially is the monster manual. All these really nifty creatures, you know, that some of you've seen, some you've heard of, some of you've never had any dreams about. Um, you could take almost any creature out of the Ultimate Adversaries book, apply the highly evolved template to it, and then go into the uh, Ataxic Effigy. I had to scour the uh, Merriam-Webster website in order to get that word Ataxic. And um, effigy, meaning not not like religious effigy or anything, or like a blasphemy, but it essentially means the evolved, like the pure evolution of something, so that you would be able to take this creature, give it a highly evolved sentientness and intelligence, and then be able to take this prestige class, and it would allow you to be able to meld into real society. There are some weird creatures that can be chosen. So just as an example, um, though it would be, would be kind of weird, um, what if you wanted to play um, the famed Gundark? Four arms, really, really strong creature. Well, you could. So, I mean, there's that. Um, it actually allows you to start to reclaim some of the stuff that highly evolved templates take away from you. Because actually, whenever you take it, you lose some of your natural weapon damage and some of your special abilities because you're gaining something else. So it's like you're getting away from your bestial side. This prestige class gives you a little bit of it back. It's actually one of the niftier um, abilities that I, or prestige classes that I created. Another one is a Galactic Bailiff. Um, bounty hunters would go after personal glory or his, his or her own namesake. A Justicar is sent, uh, sent to, by the reigning authorities in a sector. Uh, a galactic bailiff is neither one of those. It's like a force using, like, 
a force using like um, kind of like a paladin almost. Uh, that's where I drew the inspiration from. Uh, was directly from D and D three point five paladin ideal, uh, and it got some really nifty, um, really nifty access to stuff dealing with like authority figures. I called it legal push and then legal shove, not legal pull. Legal push and then legal shove. You know, you'd be able to go up to um, any usually anybody with any kind of like recognized government or military and be able to make like a, a special check to be able to get something done, get somebody relieved, get somebody, you know, whatever, uh, get, get the job done and not have to be a noble using a favor check. Nobles using favor checks can be overused. They're a part of the mechanics of the game, but they can be abused if your game master doesn't know how to, hmm, how to regulate things. Uh, Galactic Bailiff actually deals specifically with like more of the, the, sector factions, <clears throat> and the government organizations. Um, one of the other biggest things that I created besides those was a whole host of other pursuit classes. I'll do this quick. Uh, I created what was called Wild Cannon. See, there's no splash damage in Star Wars. Uh, there's no splash weaponry either, except for like grenades, right? So I created something that was kind of what reminded me of Blaine from the movie Predator. Jesse, the body of Ventura's character, how he carried the fucking minigun with him, right? Uh, sorry. Um, he carried the minigun with him, and he was able to affect multiple targets all at the same time. Well, that doesn't happen in Star Wars. Uh, I did have to rein in a bit of the cheapness that some of the rules, like, ignore, so that if you down somebody, there was a chance you could attack maybe one other person, depending on your situation. But there was no actual splash damage, so I created, and I called it the Wild Cannon Pump. Excuse the, the dinky little notepad. Uh, I burned through a forest of trees with this thing. Uh, Wild Cannon is able to actually do splash damage and avoid um, avoid jamming. Uh, burnout, basically. Um, one of the other big ones that I like was called the Rodian Tweaker. Modeled specifically after one scene in Bad Boys 2. Whenever... Was it Bad Boys 2? No, it was Bad Boys 1. Yeah, it was the first Bad Boys. Whenever... Mike went back with Marcus to go to uh, the King Royal Tire place to go out to, to talk to Jojo the Tire Man, right? Um, how initially he had basically lied to him about what was going on. And then they had to come back and they cornered him specifically whenever Mike, um, Will Smith's character, uh, pushed him down, had had basically enough since he lost his friend and he had, he had very short temper at that point, pushed him down, held him at gunpoint, and basically was going to go ahead and just just uh, go ahead and pop one off in his head. And then Marcus was trying to trying to talk him out of it. And then Mike pulls his other gun and points it at his own partner. Says, you want some of this? And I'll bust one in your ass too. And Mike just kind of, or, you know, he kind of looked at him. And then Marcus just kind of said, so sad and kind of walked away. You know, the situation had gone so out of hand that he wasn't going to get shot for it. Uh, Rody and Tweaker specifically deal with using two blaster pistols at the same time and specifically use intimidation. Big intimidation bonuses to be able to do that. Um, unfortunately, I'm running out of time and only got to about through half of this. I can do the other half next time. Um, and I also created the Bloodline, which I'll get into next time. I did promise you guys the story. A long time ago, many, many moons ago, I got a hold of a black D20 with white numbers. Okay. Now, back then, I had just started playing Original Core Rules, which is the series of books that no longer are valid using RCR stuff. And I just started playing it. And I just started reading it so that I could be the GM for my group. And I got this die. I called it my Stormtrooper die. Now, granted, obviously, as you can see, uh, Stormtroopers should be white die with black numbers. Well, I do have one of those, and I do have plenty of other dice. But this one's very special to me because it always seems that when this needs to botch in order to keep uh, inappropriate deaths of my, my, my PCs away from the gaming table, it always seems to come through for me. Unfortunately, this is also the same dice that I used last night. I had a mimic eat one of my players. So it can be a little possessed at times, and everybody basically fears this die. Um, I only use it for my NPCs and my bad guys. I do not use it for my personal means. 
for any of my NPCs that I make in order to play. This is only for my NPCs and my bad guys. It stays negatively charged because of it, because it has done nothing good in the gaming world. And added to the fact that I'm rolling it out of a dis disembodied skull. Kind of, kind of, kind of is creepy. Um, but it's it's my favorite die out of every one that I actually own, even after the first one I bought, my very first die. My Stormtrooper die is very, very special to me. So I'm going to go ahead and end this edition. Uh, sorry that everything ran together. I will get back to the other prestige classes and the bloodlines that I made on the next edition of the Rancor Pit. If you'd like the video, please give it a thumbs up and hit the subscribe button if you want to get to the other videos on my channel. And give it a share. Spread it around. I'm on Twitter. I'm on YouTube, obviously. I'm on Facebook. And I own. we own the big group of Southern Ontario Role Playing Association. We own Sorpa. It's all about gaming, so I am in other places. Just got to look for me. Um, but uh, until then, grab your dice and roll initiative.